A big thank you to Ant9 Audio for sponsoring this video. They make the Mod Mic Wireless, the microphone I've used for the last two months. More on that later. Enjoy the video. So it may not look like it, but this is a $500 gaming PC, or it will be. It's easy to build, it's readily available, it's mostly new, and it doesn't require any special deals. Basically, you can build it yourself right now. But are you better off buying an Xbox or a PS5 instead? It's been about a year since I built my $500 Xbox Series X killer. And back then, it was a real challenge that took a few months to accomplish. But a lot has changed. PC parts are way cheaper and we're finally in a new generation of video cards. Now don't get me wrong, the PS5 and Series X are still feats of engineering. But I do think the playing field has evened out a little bit. So what can you build right now without spending months on Facebook Marketplace like I did a year ago? And can it reach console level performance? Let's find out. Starting out, we have the 6 core Ryzen 5 5500 for 100 US dollars. Now this is two less cores than a comparable Xbox or PS5 CPU, but it won't really make that big of a difference in games. You can also grab the Ryzen 5 3600 and Thermalright Assassin Cooler for like $84 if you want to save a little bit of money. They are near identical in performance. And I'm pairing our Ryzen processor with a B450M motherboard, 16 gigs of RAM, and a 512 gig SSD. Now this specific motherboard has Bluetooth and Wi-Fi built in, and that will save us a lot of money in the long run. It's only $80 new for the motherboard, and then $32 new for the RAM. I recommend picking up at least a 512 gig NVMe SSD. They're like $29. It's half the capacity of a console, but it's a worthy compromise in order to stay on budget. Just do not buy a SATA one like I did accidentally. It's way slower, and they're about the same price. Go NVMe. I recommend at least a 550 watt power supply and the Apivia Prestige 600 watt fits the bill. Right now you're not going to find a better unit for $52 and the OEM who actually makes the unit, Anderson, is fairly reliable so you don't have to worry about it blowing up. Now I again ordered the incorrect model, the Thermaltake Smart 500 watt. It's still going to work but it's not ideal. Get the Prestige. I'm housing the PC inside of the Sama IM01, which was the same case that I used for my previous Xbox Series X build. I want to emulate console portability and design as much as possible, and this is the closest I can get to it. It supports micro ATX motherboards, full length GPUs, a full sized ATX power supply, and it's technically the small-ish form factor that we can get on this budget. Now, if you don't like cases of this size, I have other options available as well, but for $60, it's hard to say no. And lastly, the GPU. Now, because of console optimization and operating system shenanigans, we can't directly compare a console's GPU to a PC's GPU, but we can give a range. For the PS5, the weaker of the two, it's somewhere between an RTX 3060 and 4060 from NVIDIA, or an RX 6600 to a 7600 from AMD. The GPU I chose is the RTX 2060 Super 8GB, and it's on the lower end of that spectrum. Other options include the RX 6600M for about $130, or the RX 5700 XT for about $163. Overall, I think we have ourselves a pretty good build that will look good and feel good. So let's build it and see if it beats the consoles. So, after sprucing up the PC, I think the build came out looking really, really nice. Performance, on the other hand, whew, that's a long story, so buckle in. My 2060 Super was fine out of the box, but my Ryzen 5 was not. 95 degrees is not good, to put it simply. So after scrummaging through Gigabyte's BIOS, I was able to tweak PBO with the following settings. I enabled a negative 25 PBO offset, 
and then set the wattage limit for the processor to 50 watts. The low power idle state still worked and temperatures dropped nearly 15 degrees. And the GPU was still within safe operating temperature, but I undervolted it slightly to save a couple of degrees and about 10 watts of power. Now this entire process took me an entire morning to do, but I'm very glad I did it. And with that, we're finally ready to battle the consoles. Let's break down the PC versus console battle into four different categories. Size, power consumption, gaming performance, and cost. Let's start out with size. This is a bloodbath. The consoles will be noticeably smaller than pretty much any PC at the same price. The Xbox Series X and PS5 are both about 7 liters, and my Sama IM01 case is about 22 liters. It's a 3x increase, consoles take the win. Okay, how about power consumption? According to this article I found, the PS5 peaks at about 230 watts in Cyberpunk performance mode, and the Series X is about 100 and 90 watts. My computer capped at about 300 watts during the Cyberpunk benchmark on performance mode, and it sat in the upper 200s while gaming. Consoles, yet again, take the win. All right, so the PS5 and Xbox are more power efficient and they use space more effectively. But what about cost? Both consoles cost $500 for the full non-cut down version. And my computer with the fans and all the components was about $506. So mine's mildly more expensive, but it's also a full blown computer. This means I'm not limited to just gaming. So there's more innate value with my purchase over a console. I also don't need to pay like $160 a year for PlayStation Plus or $120 a year for Xbox Live or Game Pass Corp, whatever they're calling it nowadays in order to play online. Even if I take into account the power savings cost from a console, a console would still be more expensive after a few months if I'm subscribed to anything. So I think in most cases, a computer is going to be more cost effective. So computer takes the win. And what about gaming? The stuff that most people care about. If you wanna know whether or not this computer just plays games regardless of console comparisons, it does, and it's really, really good. Valorant and New World, two games only available on PC, look good and play well. Valorant averaged around 300 FPS with competitive settings at 1080p. For once, I can't blame my ineptitude on a slow computer. I just suck, as you can see by the gameplay, but played well. New World at 1080p with medium settings worked great in both city centers and in combat. And it was even more fun because I don't suck nearly as much. Even multitasking is great. I can have Spotify up with a Discord call while in a raid and it's a ton of fun. I mean, the worst part is when someone in your squad has a microphone that they just grabbed out of a trash compactor. Ozzy, are you here for the gank? Thankfully, Antlion's Chimera and ModMic Wireless are here to help. Like I mentioned at the start of the video, I've been using the ModMic Wireless for a few months and it's been one of the best investments I've ever made. I can use it as my main microphone for YouTube videos, which I've been doing for the last two videos, but if I want to play games with friends, I just pop it on my headphones and I'm good to go. And it sounds really really good. I use Audacity and all I do is noise removal, some bass boost, and then I up the gain a little bit and that's that's all my processing. It attaches to practically any surface with its patented adhesive plus magnet clasp system. Through its magic dongle and Aptex technology it has lower latency than Bluetooth and phenomenal range. It has a noise cancellation mode, a broadcast mode for a richer sound, you like that. A dedicated mute button, a 12 hour battery life, and a two year warranty. As a content creator and a tinfoil level smite player, I couldn't be more satisfied. After two months of dedicated use, it definitely has my seal of approval. And if you use code OSTOX, you get 15% off mod mic and mod mic accessories. Link will be in the description. And thank you so much, mod mic, for sponsoring this video. Absolutely love this thing. All right, back to console shenanigans. Comparing PC gaming to console gaming is hard, but the wonderful people at Digital Foundry have translated console settings over to PC settings. That is a huge help, so thank you to them, 
and we will use them as a reference guide. In Cyberpunk 2077, the PS5's performance mode targets 60 FPS with a resolution of 1800p. I copied these settings over as much as I could. I had to use 1871p because 1800p was not available at my screen ratio. The PS5 sits at 60 FPS for the most part with a few dips in the 50s, but I cannot say the same for my computer. It's close, but in the benchmark, we averaged about 52 FPS. And in the opening scene, which is much easier to run than Night City, we sat in the upper 40s and lower 50s. It's still good. Like that's still a good number, good performance, but it doesn't match the PS5. Now, Alan Wake 2 was surprisingly good on my computer, but let's discuss the PS5 first. The PS5 in performance mode, has an output resolution of 1440p and targets 60fps. It uses low to medium settings and has FSR balance mode enabled. The PS5 is in the low to mid 50s in this area and with the translated PC settings, I'm seeing about the same performance. Now rain can affect performance here, but it's still a pleasant surprise that we're at least on the PS5's heels. So who wins in gaming? I think if we're gonna go at just a raw number standpoint, the consoles do here. And it makes sense. I mean, they have stronger hardware and they have better optimization. They're also much quieter than my PC. Cyberpunk running, the fans are basically at full blast. <laughs> yeah, you're pretty loud. But there are many, many upsides to PC gaming. There are more PC exclusives than console exclusives. There are more emulation options. You have more control over your game settings. It's easier to play online with friends. Competitive play is way better on the PC. And this $500 computer that we've built is powerful enough to take advantage of all of those features. From a purely objective standpoint, I have to give it to the consoles. Like I, I can't lie with the numbers, but I can totally see arguments for either way. It really depends on what you want. And PC gaming, even if your PC is a tier slower than a console, can still be considered better. So with all of this being said, it's still really difficult to build a current generation $500 console killer PC. Does this mean that you should forego computers altogether? Of course not. A computer is a multimodal device, and that's something that I didn't even talk about much in this video on purpose but you can do way more than just game. A slightly slower gaming computer is going to be a way better investment than a console for a ton of different people. You can also upgrade the components, and since we're three years into the life cycle of current gen consoles, that's just gonna become an even more important point. But I wanna hear y'all's thoughts. Do you think that it is possible to build a $500 console killing machine using mostly new parts right now? Like, where did I mess up? Or if it's not possible, when do you think it will be? I have a feeling that the next generation of video cards will be a pretty big decider of that. But thank you guys so much for watching. Thank you so much Antline for the mod mic and the Camera microphones. Definitely check them out. Description will be, link will be in the description below. There you go. <laughs> Happy Thanksgiving to all my Americans and I'll see you guys later. Peace. Man, that was such an awkward outro.